We welcome to our BIMA tonight, Rabbi Rebecca Dubow. And it's a pleasure for me to welcome her, not just to our congregation because she's a wonderful rabbi, but she and I have been classmates and friends and spent many a biennial or WRN convention together, sitting in the front row watching the ASL interpreter. And it's just a pleasure to be able to pray with you together and also to have this opportunity to hear your words of Torah. I want to share with you a little bit more about Rabbi Rebecca Dubo. She is a native of Los Angeles, California. She was ordained by Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion, and has served several synagogues, including Thousand Oaks, California, Hollywood, California, and New Brunswick, New Jersey. Currently, as I mentioned earlier, she's the rabbi for Moses Montefiore Congregation in Bloomington, Illinois. Since Rabbi Dubo's arrival during the summer of 2015, she has played an active role as the spokesperson on behalf of the small but vibrant Jewish community in Bloomington. Rabbi Dubo serves as the co-chair of the Faith and Outreach Committee associated with the Not in Our Town organization. Not in Our Town is a grassroots movement about stopping hate, addressing bullying, and building safe, inclusive communities for all. In addition, Rabbi Dubo co-founded the McLean County Interfaith Alliance, which promotes interfaith dialogue and fellowship within the greater Bloomington normal faith communities. In 2016, Rabbi Dubo was awarded an honorary doctorate of humane letters from the Delaware Valley University PA. And in 2018, she received an honorary doctorate of divinity from the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion. Besides serving the rabbinate full-time, Rabbi Dubo offers her time to the greater Jewish deaf community. This community has a special place in Rabbi Dubo's life as she is the first female deaf rabbi ordained in the world. Rabbi Dubo has spoken at numerous synagogues throughout the country, written various articles and led webinars about the importance of inclusion within the Jewish community. And we welcome you tonight. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you for the wonderful words of welcome, Rabbi um, Memes Folo. And um, it's an honor to be here. And thank you for inviting our congregation to Beth Emmett, the Faith Synagogue. It's good to know uh, you have a great clergy team. I have had the honor to know Rabbi London. And also, I know Cantor Kyle may not know me personally, but I do know his father. We were pretty much in the same neighborhood for quite some time while I was in Thousand Oaks and you were in Calabasas. I also want to thank Mazel Tov to the Kaplan family and I have I hope you have a wonderful joyful day tomorrow. Okay. So years ago I was um, sitting in my study and my assistant came running in and she said you, you must go to the hospital immediately Someone had requested to see you. So I quickly drove to the hospital, assuming that it was an emergency call. I entered into the patient's room and there she was sitting in her chair, looking quite miserable. I said, hello, is everything okay? How can I help? Oh, Rabbi, with a pained look in her face. The patient daughter said, please come, come look at this. And she showed me a hearing aid and complained that it wasn't working. Of course, I knew what the problem was. I changed the battery and I put it back in the patient's ear. And she had the biggest smile on her face and she could not stop talking. So much for the life of a rabbi. I mean, this is not something, not something you know, we've learned at the seminary, but I, I knew what to do. Uh, I often chuckle when I reflect back during my college rabbinical school days and how my professors would respond to my deafness. There was one rabbi who had this real thick mustache. In case you were wondering, it was Yossi, Yossi Lashem, Yossi. Um, I, I explained to him how difficult it was to read his lip. So he trimmed it just a little bit, but 
he never understood that when he turned back to write on the blackboard while continuing to speak at the same time, that there was no way that I can follow his lecture. And then there was this professor, oh, bless his generous heart, after I explained to him that I needed to sit up front and see his face so that I can write my notes and follow the lecture at the same time. He said, oh, okay. Shortly after class was over, the professor asked me two questions. Now, remember this was in the late 1980s, 1990s, for some of you young people may not know, uh, ever heard of this, but first he asked me, well, how about if I use a tape recorder in class? How can I use the tape recorder? And then the second question he asked me, well, well perhaps you can get the notes in Braille. Braille. So, so humor is one of the main keys to survival, especially when we are identified or labeled as different within our society. The truth is that each of us and every one of us is different. Some of us are differently able are from a multi-ethnic or interfaith family. Some of us are LGBTQIA+, people of color, single parents, parents of special needs, obsessed with Twitter or Instagram or serious cub fan or devoted followers of Star Trek or The Crown. In one way or another, no matter which labels are given, we have much more in common and yet at the same time, we are unique in our own ways. If any of you identify with the different labels, you know how exhausting it can be to face daily encounters with those who are determined to challenge our identity, judge us or make us less valued. And the Torah taught us that we were created in B'Selem Elohim, in God's image, and that should be good enough. At my parents first born, I was the most perfect, beautiful baby girl they have ever met. I was no different from any other baby, and that was good enough. They thought I understood everything because I was always smiling. At the age of 22 months, my grandmother noticed that I was not responding to sound. So my parents took me to the doctors and were informed that I had a severe, profound hearing loss. At first it was a shock to my parents, but they realized that I was their child and they would do everything possible to make my life as productive and beautiful as it is to this day. Being a part of the Jewish community, celebrating the holidays and attending the synagogue was very important to my family, even though I was the only deaf person in the family. When I went to a Jewish sleepaway camp, I would dread those nighttime activities because I could not see or hear anything. It, it, it meant that I would miss most of my rabbi's sermons, which wasn't so bad. And I would read and follow the prayer book on my own and not where the congregation was doing services. And yet my life was filled with many beautiful experiences. Every Friday night the Shabbat candle would glow. I would sit in the pews with my grandfather of blessed memory and he wore the most magnificent talit that my grandmother had made. I prepared my bat mitzvah, chanted my haptorah, spoke in the front of the entire congregation, got married under the, under the kuppah, and gave birth to my two daughters and much more. My Jewish identity was solid. Prior to going to college, I did not know many deaf people because I was educated and fully mainstreamed within the hearing community. My first language was English and then Hebrew as I attended a Jewish day school during my elementary years. When I went, I, I attended CSUN, 
California State University of Northridge as a freshman. It was there that I discovered my deaf identity. I took a beginner's ASL class and learned as much as I could so that I could communicate with my new friends. There were over 200 deaf students at the time that I was there. ASL, American Sign Language, is my third language that I know. It was a major transformation of my life because for the first time I met others who were different but really just like me. It was the shared that I met my beloved Michael there and we've been together for almost 40 years. In our Jewish tradition, beginning with the rule of the Halakha, there is clear evidence that the rabbis struggle to search ways to deal with those who did not fit according to their beliefs within the norm of their society. There were specific cases as to whether a deaf person was able to get married, act as a witness, or whether or not it was permissible for one to turn on a tyranny on Shabbat. The deaf was categorized as mute because the rabbi did not know at the time that sign language was an authentic language and not just guessers using hands. The developmentally challenged were also placed in the same category with the deaf muse, that they should have no responsibility, responsibilities within the process of traditional Judaism, because the assumption was that they are not unable to understand or respond to anything. As educated reform Jews, there are halakhic teachings that do not make sense, nor do we feel obligated to follow them. Do I fit the halakhic description who does not, uh, one who does not understand anything? Does anyone fit in that category? No, now, obviously not to my parents, nor to my community. But the reality remains that there are many families with different abilities or special needs who struggle to be accepted within the greater Jewish community. As you heard earlier this evening about the 12 question, Parashat Yitro, we learn about God granting the Ten Commandments to Moses and to the people of Israel. It was a quite a dramatic story but it's interesting to note that the Torah does not explain to what exactly God was doing during that time of divine revelation at Mount Sinai. No one really knows. Some believe that God wrote the entire Torah word by word. Others believe that it was carved in stone with the finger of God. And then there are those who believe that God did not speak or write, rather inspired Moses to write the Torah. There, there, there are many different explanations and the debate continued as to what really happened at Mount Sinai. No matter what we think, we can certainly agree that it was a very important event. The rabbi indicated that when the Israelites encountered God at Sinai, each person heard, experienced, or recognized a divine voice in a personal and an individual way. Since there were over 600,000 people at Sinai, we can, might take that to mean that God spoke to the assembly in at least 600,000 different voices all at once. That is true inclusion. Every single person was granted the full experience of divine revelation if they received the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai. And we are taught to believe that we too have all stood at Mount Sinai. This means that I heard God's voice at Sinai and so have you. I heard God's voice.
There are times when people do not know what you're saying, how to feel or listen when they are in the presence of someone who is quote, quote, different. Fortunately, some of our ancient rabbis understood and recognized such moments of judgment and discomfort. Reciting lessons in our tradition is a part of an important mindful process and or ritual. Therefore, the rabbis created this blessing. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Mishanei Habriot. Blessed be the one who created us differently. This is the blessing of inclusion. This is beyond about providing accommodation. It is the intentional mindset of keeping our hearts wide open. This is the blessing that every single human being is entitled to receive. May we as God's partners continue to work tirelessly to create a more inclusive Kihila Kedosha, a sacred community so that anyone who walks through the doors of the Jewish community will always be greeted with blessing, knowing that they too are capable of granting blessing to us. Can you hear what thought may be God's will? Amen. Amen.